First on film and entertainment, Alex first with you alongside Greg King and Peter Krause. Gentlemen, a very warm welcome to both of you. I'm going to start by talking about one of the greatest individual efforts on the stage that I have ever seen. And I want to ask you, Greg, you know the name Ruth Bader Ginsburg, do you not? Yes, she was a um, Supreme Court Justice in America. There is a documentary about her and also um, a biopic recently. Yes, indeed. Mm. So, uh, Peter, you would have seen one or both of those too? Absolutely, yes, yes. There was also a film uh, made about her early life too, yes. Well, this is a Sydney Theatre Company production, obviously touring. It's on at Playhouse Arts Centre Melbourne. Saw it on opening night, which was Friday evening. Oh, my golly. Well, look, this is just a virtuoso performance by Heather Mitchell. She metamorphosizes into Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And unquestionably, as I said at the outset, one of the greatest solo theatrical offerings this country has had the good fortune to witness. If you get the chance, I know you don't like theatre, Greg, uh, Peter, rather. Greg, I reckon you would love this. I think, Peter, you'd love this as well. She was the second woman to be appointed to the U.S. Supreme Court. And Mitchell talks about her love of family, the law and opera. And, of course, she's also passionate about gender equality and abortion rights. It starts from a position where she struggled to gain a foothold in the legal profession, even though she topped her year at Columbia Law School in New York. And she had three strikes against her. Namely, she was a woman, she was a mother, and she was Jewish. Now, you've got to remember the time that this was. And even though the marks were there, her intelligence was unquestioned, people were reluctant to give her the chance. But when she did get it, she was nothing if not fiercely intelligent. She was thorough, she was vociferous, and she prosecuted case after case, many high profile for win after win. So it starts in 1993, and that's when Ginsburg's preparing to meet the then US President Bill Clinton. And he has to decide whether Ginsburg will fill one of nine positions on the Supreme Court bench. So after their meeting, she nervously awaits a phone call that will determine her fate. One of the many distinguishing features of this exquisite offering by Heather Mitchell is her ability to mimic the voices and accents of some of the key players in RBG's life. And we're talking about her beloved husband, Marty, and three presidents, Clinton, Obama, and Trump. Resonating throughout this discourse are the words of her mother, which call upon her to hold her outrage. And that and her strict adherence to her belief in separating the judiciary from the executive. And as to that latter, much to her chagrin, she slipped up badly only once, and she spoke out against Donald, Donald Trump during the 2016 presidential campaign. She was a huge backer of Hillary. Now, she'd earlier survived a tete tate with Trump's predecessor, Barack Obama, during which he encouraged her to step aside for a younger female representative. And she took to exercise late and also became a cult figure, a pop icon known as, the remember this, the Notorious RBG, which was a play on the late rapper Notorious B.I.G., and she then graced the cover of Time magazine. She had people taking selfies with her. She was made into a meme. She had cups. She had T-shirts. She had bags sporting her visage. And did you know that she was, I, I wasn't aware of this, that she was known to her loved ones as Kiki. Did either of you know that? No. no. And that was a nickname given to her by her older sister, Marilyn, who tragically died from meningitis at the age of six. And the moniker was afforded because it's said that as a young un, she used to kick her legs all day. So she became kicky. Grief and overcoming diversity, well, they were themes that resonated throughout RBG of many. One, still, Mitchell manages to channel the remarkable life of Ruth Bader Ginsburg with heart and soul, with warmth, with humour and humanity, dynamism and dexterity. And she's flawless, readily portraying RBG is feisty and formidable. Just her, with only a handful of props holding us, the audience, riveted for a hundred minutes without interval. Beautifully written by an Australian-British playwright, screenwriter, novelist, librettist, lawyer, Susie Miller, who did that brilliant production of Prima Facie. She, she wrote that, and it moves back and forth in time. So 
stirring operatic interludes add gravitas, and the composer and sound designer is Paul Charlier. So too the well-realised colour palette in the lighting design by Alexander Balage. The costuming, by the way, leisurely, exercise gear, judiciary robes, you name it, by set and the costume designer David Fleischer. That's noteworthy as well. It is the complete package. RPG at Mini 1. It's triumphant. It's dramatic. At times comedic. Totally enthralling. Directed with aplomb by Priscilla Jackson. Do not miss it. If you see one production this year, this is the one you should see. That is why I'm starting this week's program with RBG of Medi One on at Playhouse Arts Centre Melbourne until the 12th of May. So, I mean, I hope I've whetted your appetite, Gregory King. Not really, Alex. Why? 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 It's such I'll... a dapper response to what I've just said. I've seen the documentary and the a couple of films about. Uh, yeah, but see what I'm doing more because I mean it, it's like you don't understand the difference between theatre and film when okay. you've got a human. Well, but, but when you've got hu, no, but when you've got a human being in front of you, Greg, and and you're actually see it's it's that extra dimension that it adds. That's the one thing I love movies absolutely adore them. That's why I love IMAX in particular because you know when you've got that extra dimension there it, it brings it closer to the closer to it but brings you closer to the action but there's nothing like anything can change from night to night in theater and they're right that that's the thing that is i don't know what I, I honestly don't know whether you you see enough theater to appreciate the difference and that difference is really marked when you see something like i've seen the others as well and i i thought they were terrific but this is really a cut above this is this is one of the best things i've ever seen greg so anyway um, I mean, you don't. I'm not forcing you to go, but I was just disappointed in your reaction. That's all. So I'll put that on the record. Now, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to disappoint you, Alex, but there you, you do. Well, that you do. And as far as um, you're concerned, Peter, you're 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 lost, aren't you? Correct. You're totally lost. Uh, if there's a film version of that theatrical production, I'll be happy to look at it. Oh golly, you <laughs> both of you. This is a very very bad stuff. All right. We are on here on Jay Air eighty eight FM. I'm I'm deflated after that. Having said that, let me talk to you about the Fall Guy, which uh, well, it's fun. I mean, it's there's lots of action, there's airy scenes, there's eye jinks. It's a romantic comedic drama. It runs for a bit, two hours and six minutes, and it's rated M. Colt Sievers, played by Ryan Gosling, what a fine actor he is, and Emily Blunt likewise. He loves his job, he loves his life, and he's a big movie stunt man and. He's a body double for an arrogant action star called Tom Ryder, played by Aaron Taylor Johnson. More than that, though, Colt Seavers is head over heels for a camera operator called Jodie Marino. That's the role filled by Emily Blunt, Blunt, rather, and she aspires to be a director. So the two of them, Willie, are head over heels for each other. As he says, he's working with his dream girl on a dream job. And, of course, they love the moments they steal away together. But Ryder doesn't like to see Seavers hog the limelight. And so that can and does involve reshooting scenes. Ryder's indulgences, this is the the big action star played by Aaron Taylor Johnson, are countenanced by his longtime producer, Gail Meyer, played by Hannah Waddingham, who recognises there's big money to be made by satisfying her charge. And then on one such reshoot, everything goes horribly wrong. A free fall ends tragically with Seavers breaking his back. And that puts him in a dark place, which sees him push Marino away, even though she wants to be there for him. So we move on 18 months, and he's in a dead-end job parking cars for a living. Then he receives an unexpected call from the producer, Gail Meyer. And she tells him that Marino is making her first movie, which is an alien fantasy, and wants Seavers back on set this time in sunny Sydney. For anyone else, Seavers would say no, but this is not anyone else. In fact, Maya has lied to Seavers about Marino's wishes. Marino had no idea Maya was calling Seavers. And truth be told, Tom Ryder has gotten in with a rough crowd and gone missing, and Maya is anxious to track him down before the movie goes belly up. So that becomes Seavers' job, alongside shooting stunt scenes and winning back Marino's broken trust and heart. This time, though, instead of shooting blanks, the bad guys mean business. And at the helm 
of the Fall Guy is former real-life stuntman David Leach, who did Fast and Furious, Hobbs and Shaw, among other movies. And the script is from the Hobbs and Shaw screenwriter, Drew Pearce, based on the TV series of the same name that ran from 1981 to 1986. Lee Majors, of course, was Colt Seavers in that television series. But the key to this is orchestrated mayhem. Explosions, car chases, rollovers, they are par for the course. It all looks mighty impressive. Overlaying it is good-natured nonsense, and it's a tribute also to the unsung heroes of Hollywood, of course, the stunt performers. No shortage of in-jokes by way of references to other movies. Some of the stunts, by the way, in this stunt-laden movie are spectacular. Individually, also collectively, Gosling and Blunt perfectly cast, an easy-going natural chemistry between the pair, and both, let's be honest, are mighty fine and likeable actors. So they click from their first scene together. They even manage to pull off a series of cheesy one-liners that liberally populate this movie. Uh, it's in the realm of pure escapism and farce. It's lightweight entertainment that you can just allow to wash over you but enjoy at the same time. Hannah Waddington is a regular presence as the pushy producer hiding a dark secret. Her deliberately ingratiating performance really serves to irritate just as it's meant to. And Aaron Taylor-Johnson well captures the petulance of the action hero who thinks far too much of himself. Shot on home soil, I mean, that should go down a treat with local audiences. Sydney looks great. And it is loads of fun. It, it, filmmakers have thrown the kitchen sink at it with big name stars at the helm and it works. And I, I've got to say, do not leave before the final credits because the behind the scenes footage of the stunts is well worth seeing. Did you like it, Greg King? I thought it was a bit of fun. Um, as you said, some of the stunt work here is fantastic. And, but the plot itself is so generic um, and it's basically it's a hook of which to um, hang the, these fantastic stunts. The highlight for me was the um, chasing the skip across through the careering out of control through the streets of Sydney over the bridge and everything. Sydney looks great again. I can see why they shot it here. And the film gets by on the chemistry between Blunt and Gosling alone. They, they get Did you agree with that, Greg? Uh, I, I just thought the chemistry was fabulous between yeah. the pair. Yeah. Really? I, really. I think that, that carries the film a little bit. I think that's really good there. Um, also, behind-the-scenes stuff about how some of these stunts operate um, is also so fantastic. Um, the stunt men are the unsung heroes of the film industry risking life and limb for the sake of entertainment there. And there have been a couple of films that have explored the role of stunt men, um, notably Hooper, um, the Burt Reynolds film in which he was a veteran stunt man uh, in a rivalry with a younger up-and-coming stunt man played by Jan Michael Vincent. And, of course, the um, stunt man was um, Stephen Ralph Batten and Peter O'Toole but this one is a lot of fun, and the, the stunts are truly fantastic. Um, I like um, the Hannah Waddington character. She was a bit of um, a nice um, fallout chewing the scenery there. Um, Aaron Taylor-Johnson, okay, as the arrogant, narcissistic um, action hero who does it. I'm using talking marks here, does his own stunts. Um, but as I said, the plot is a little bit unbelievable, a bit far-fetched. But, yeah, look, all this on the screen, the film is a lot of fun, and there are a couple of delightful... Um, last minute cameos here that sort of set the scene. So it is a bit of fun. Leave your brain at the door. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, that's true. And I, 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 I'm just trying to think, have there ever been any more, has there ever been any more stunts in a movie, Peter? There, there was just so many of them. And I kind of wondered that. John but the other four. Thing, pardon me? John Reed at four. Yeah, but, but I mean, where the, the, the fight, the fight in the middle of the Trump's Elise and there's tumbled down the stairs fighting and kicking all the way. I do, I do remember that, but I'm just saying that the, the, the sheer volume of, of one after another after another, um, I mean, the full, obviously it's called the full guy uh, for, for a reason. Uh, the, the other yeah, thing. Man, the full guy, it's the full guy also because you've been set up to take the blame for a crime. Correct. Absolutely. That's double double meaning. Double meaning. Uh, correct. The, the other aspect here, Peter. I want to know now what full guys, what, what stunt men get paid and women. Right, right. I'm curious because you know that they very rarely get the acclaim that they deserve, and uh, it just got me thinking. Well, you know, how do you if you make a living as a stunt man, you know, in Hollywood, what what would you get paid compared to the the millions that the stars of the films get paid? Any idea? No, but Yakima Kanut, who uh, was a famous uh, stunt man in Hollywood often commented on how uh, 
such a small percentage of yes. the film's budget was allocated to uh, stunt people and to other effects. I'd like to think that maybe that's changed somewhat, but perhaps that it hasn't. I mean, surely the danger money alone, you'd have to be... Because I wonder how many of them... Can you imagine doing this for a living, you know, crashing into things, being rolled over, etc. what it does to your body long term? Can you... I just... I, I, you know how they, they... You would know nothing about this, Peter, because it's about sport, but, you know, concussion and things of that nature, which are being talked about so much... In this day and age, I, it have to that would have to be one of the the um, talking points for stunt people, would it not? Well, of course, but they are trained very carefully trained, and uh, certainly present day stunt people are, are, are very careful about how they look after themselves and to make sure that they're not hurt um, in making a film. So, so I would would hope. So, okay, did you enjoy this, Peter, or not? Um, it's so so. I, I, I found this a rather flashy, um, underwritten film, uh, in many respects. I thought the, uh, the murder plot development was ridiculous. I thought some of the characterizations, like Hannah Waddingham, who, uh, who's channeling, uh, Olivia Coleman, uh, eating the scenery, um, was a little bit over the top for me. And, and yes, uh, Gosling and, uh, and Blunt, uh, are pretty good together. They're well matched. Yes, it's well shot. Yes, there are some good special effects. But I still remember the days of, and I was there at the launch, of Buster Keaton's uh, films. <laughs> Sorry, I mean, I mean you, you, you were already in midlife at that stage, weren't you, Bruno? <laughs> That's right. Stop, stop the flattering person. yourself. I mean, you know, it, it, can you, actually, can you tell me about the days when electric light was invented? Can you, you know, perhaps take us back there, give us a bit of a dissertation? You, Those you're, days were... Well, I'd love to, but those days were so difficult because watching television by candlelight was ridiculous. <laughs> please, and... <laughs> please, please go on, you Neanderthal. You keep going. Okay. Well, uh, I just wish the script was was better written, and because um, I hark back, apart from the Keaton films, which are full of uh, wonderful stunts. The the 1980 film that Greg refers to, uh, The Stuntman with Peter O'Toole, which had a really good storyline and dramatic uh, uh, effects in it. Uh, and the TV series with Lee Majors, as you mentioned, was very good as well. And the film The Fall, which uh, is about oh, 15, 20 years old and was a wonderful look at a, an early stuntman and, uh, and his travails. Look, uh, yes, it's flashy, it's well done, it's... Uh, quite good to watch but I just didn't feel that it was strong enough in terms of the writing and in terms of the storyline and that's what I always look for the yeah, quality look, of the I, writing. I, would, I would agree with you Peter and and Greg as well in that regard that it's 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 not you know the best written film ever made but I suppose I took it for what it was as I say lightweight entertainment I'm going to give it the highest mark I believe out of all of that so let's start with you then Peter because you'll give it the low mark as usual the Fall Guy, M rated, <laughs> run for two hours, six minutes. And your score? Yeah, it's okay. Five out of ten. Yeah, that's what I expected. I, I should have said to you straight away, Greg, you'll be a little bit more generous. What are you going to, going to give it? Six out of ten. Yeah, as I thought, and I'm giving it a seven and a half. So there you go. I should be I should be predicting your scores before you give them, mate, rather <laughs> than sort of say commenting afterwards. Is that is that correct? Now, I want to go to a movie with a Jewish theme that opens this week. Uh, and it's opened at film festivals and it's opened abroad. It's called Golda and it's PG rated. It runs for 100 minutes. And it's about Israel's first and only female prime minister, Golda Meir, who served in that capacity from 1969 to 1974. And not surprisingly, she's painted as tough and unrelenting. So the greatest challenge for... Uh, is, have you ever seen a movie with more smoking in it, please? Let, let, can you explain that to me, Peter? Good golly. <laughs> that was yes. unbelievable. Seriously, is, I, I, I mean, he was I, apparently a heavy smoker, and that was allowed in the time, even including in the hospitals, apparently. Yeah, but but not just her, Greg. Like, if you don't have a cigarette in your mouth, you're not an actor. It, it's kind of like it's almost it's almost like lighting up itself as a character, a way of coping with stress, don't you think? It goes back to old stage. You being a, a theatre critic, Alex should know you've got to give the ha people something to do with their hands. Right, I'm not going to even comment on that any further, Greg. But fa thank you for that. Uh, look, it, the, 
the, the greatest challenge for Golda Meir was navigating a conflict that could have finished Israel for good, which was the Yom Kippur War. And the Israelis really were caught napping when Egypt and Syria launched a coordinated attack or attacks, plural, on Israel on the 6th of October 1973. And I mean, why does that day resonate? Well, it was one day before 50 years on, we have the war that Israel is currently fighting in Gaza. So, I mean, yeah, anyway, we'll get back to that in a moment. Although intelligence had suggested war was imminent, the Israelis hadn't mobilized earlier when they could have. And and that's, that had to do with hubris as, as much as anything else. So Golda deals with that three-week war and its aftermath, I'm talking about the Yom Kippur War, focusing on the pressure uh, that the Prime Minister was under. Golda, I'm talking about the movie. So what was kept secret at the time was that she was also fighting cancer. But the movie isn't just about her. It's also about those around her, including her then Minister for Defence, Moshe Dayan, who's painted in a very negative light, and Chief of Staff David Dardo Elazar. So how many troops to mobilise at the outset? That was just one of the points of contention. Vital to the outcome of the war was support from the Americans, and that's where the Prime Minister's relationship with the US Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger, was critical. Bear in mind that, of course, Golda Meir was also born in America. So you know, they, they had a very strong relationship. The movie... Uh, just... She was actually born in Russia. Oh, born in Russia and then went to America. Is that right? No, raised in America. Raised in America. Raised in America. Thank you. Years. Yeah, thank you, Greg. Sorry, I apologise. And, and thanks for correcting me. The, the movie juxtaposes Golda's political wiles with the close ties she had with her longtime personal assistant and confidant, Lou Kadar. And the war devolves to an individual level when the son of a typist within Golda Meir's ministerial department, is called into service. It's been written by Nicholas Martin, who was responsible for writing Florence Foster Jenkins, and is directed by Guy Nativ, who did the movie Skin. And, well, he was born in Israel, The this is Guy Nativ, the year the war broke out, and grew up with stories about the war. It, it deals with the politics of the time that's integral to the ultimate success that Israel had, but that was far from easy or straightforward, as is shown in this movie. Helen Mirren makes for quite an astounding Golda Meir. Her representation of the PM, uncanny in terms of movement. The makeup artists, they've done an extraordinary job with the prosthetics, the hair and, and more. And the actual story unfolds through visions that Meir has while re relaying her take on what happened to a commission of inquiry that was assembled in 1974 to investigate why this was allowed to happen and they didn't do more to prevent it from happening, etc. the Yom Kippur War and all the failings that went along with it and the lead up to it. So Mirren represents Meir's weary but determined and defiant. Camille Cotton, painted as devoted and stoic as personal assistant Luke Adar, who comes out as Meir's rock. Um, so also impressive, I thought Lib Shriver uh, as the calm and measured U.S. Secretary of State. Rotem Keenan is a straight shooter. All businesses, uh, Zvi Zamir, um, no pun intended with the words straight shooter, who was the head of Mossad, which was Israel's national intelligence agency. I I'd mentioned before, I was a bit intrigued by the representation of Moshe Dayan by Rami Hoiboiger as, as rattled after he flew to inspect the extent of the initial impact of the war on Israeli fighters. Um, he's uh, he's seen as um, not really capable, which I, I found rather interesting. But this remains very much Helen Mirren's film. She doesn't put a foot wrong. It's tension-filled. It requires concentration to follow, though. It won't be everybody's cup of tea. I actually, I, I, I don't usually do this because I don't have time, but I was prevailed upon to do an interview with um, the director of this movie, which I, I did on uh, Friday. And I spoke to Guy Nativ about it, and he said, look, it totally changed. This was going to be an $80 million blockbuster, and it was all going to be based on action. And then COVID hit, and they had to rewrite the movie. They shot it during COVID. They, um, they had to sort of, they, they did a total retake, a rewrite. They introduced that character of the personal assistant and, uh, you know, totally changed from a movie that was based on, 80% based on action to uh, it based on meetings. Uh, that, that's, uh, that's what you get here. So, I mean, the budget would have been 
a fraction of what it originally was set out to be. I'm not sure whether that 80 million was an actual figure or it was just a, a generic commentary about how big a film it was going to be before COVID. So, look, it's um, it's a it's a movie, as I say, that's not going to be everybody's cup of tea, but it it plays out through those meetings that the Prime Minister has, the phone calls she took and made, uh, rather than through the actual fighting that took place. And underlying it is, is Golda Meir's personal travails. I mean, she's seen through it all as dignified and determined. And what, one thing I really did notice was an effective device, the use of close-ups and extreme close-ups that focused on Golda Meir. Uh, you know, it's her eyes, for example, they're served up, they're presented as windows to her soul. So the directors ensured that the intense pain, the scrutiny, the decision-making of the times are writ large. Uh, that's That was my take on Golda. Peter, what about yours? Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think it's a, a really well-produced film. And I similarly also spoke to a guy Nativ uh, about making the film, and he gave me that uh, the same information uh, that you've just mentioned, especially uh, Nicholas Martin, who wrote the screenplay, who did mm. a great deal of research to uh, be as accurate as possible about the uh, the meetings that took place, the smoking, uh, and uh, that everyone was smoking. Oh, and, oh my boy. I, uh, it, it's amazing we could see the film from the smoke. <laughs> that's yeah. right. You needed a, a filter or something to be yeah, able to watch yeah. <laughs> Boom, boom. All right. So, uh, look, it... it as the film developed and uh, turned into this uh, production that was shot in London, uh, I think it actually is quite effective in terms of portraying uh, the steely-eyed nature of uh, Golda Meir and her approach to defending the attack that happened uh, from Yom Kippur uh, in 1973 um, and, uh, and also the way she defended everything that she did and was very resolute in trying to save as many lives as possible. Uh, it, it was great to see Liev Schreiber as uh, Henry Kissinger. I think he it's does very good. a very, very good, good job, yeah, uh, in the role. And it was good to see Israeli actor Lior Ashkenazi as one of the uh, defence uh, members in the cabinet. So, look, it's a, it's a well-made film. It's a, it's a pared-down film. Uh, it, it isn't as expansive as I would have liked in so far as knowing more about Golda Meir, her background, etc. Although Guy did say that they're making a miniseries about uh, Golda Meir at the moment. But um, overall, it's a well-made film. And we should mention that Guy Nativ, who directed the film, has an Oscar because he won uh, an Oscar for his short film, Skin, which he then eventually turned into a feature film. So, yes, I thought it was a pretty good film. What about you, Greg? Well, Hello. when I was watching, I, I thought of you, Alice, at all the smoking scenes there, and I thought you'd shake your head at that. Yes, that's, yes. that's probably the name of realism there. Um, yeah. And I don't, Helen Mirren is almost unrecognisable here as Bold my ear with all that makeup, which apparently took about three and a half hours every day to put on. Well, in so, fact, I, I, asked, I asked that question. Did you, you as well, Peter? Did you ask that question about how long it took? And this is the, this was the answer. She got in at 4.30 in the morning. It took three and a half hours to put it on, and it took an hour and a half to take off every day. And I said, yes. well, and how long did you shoot for? 35 days, Greg. You worked that out. 35 days times five hours, right, just for the makeup. I mean, amazing. Uh, I agree with you. I mean, um, it, it's also, I mean, Guy said that Helen Mirren's 78. Is that right? That's her age? I don't know. But, um, I mean, she did it. I thought she was remarkable in this, Greg. Did you not? Yeah, she was really strong there. Um, I would like to have seen um, the, that other version with some some more of the action scenes in there as well um, because hearing about a war and seeing that, you, you're a little bit detached from what it mm. was, but it does build up the suspense there of what's happening there, especially for those who aren't sort of aware of the history of how it all unfolded there. But it's quite a revelation into what actually happened there as well. Um, Liv Schreiber did all right as Henry Kissinger um, in a small role there. But uh, this is Helen Mirren's film, I think, and she sort of rises to the occasion and it delivers a great performance there, conveying both her strength there, her intelligence, but also that vulnerability as she's undergoing that fight with cancer and that fear, she says, if they ever take, if the Arabs ever take Tel Aviv, I don't want to be a prisoner, you know. So, that, mm -hmm. so you know, it shows the strength of character of her. 
Uh, uh, remarkable. It, there have been some parallels drawn with uh, the Iron Lady, who, of course, came afterwards. Um, but, I, I mean, they were different characters. There's no question about that. So, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a strong film, but it's. It, do you agree with me, both of you, that it's not going to be everybody's cup of tea? Well, Hello? I don't know. It could be. Well, I, I just think that it's for those people who want action, it's not that sort of movie. It's action in a different sense. It's tense from meetings rather than whatever. I, I, I think, I mean, I still think it's a worthy film, don't get me wrong, but um, it'll be interesting to see what sort of audience it gets. I, I reckon um, I'm going to get, well, okay, I think we'll probably be reasonably similar in terms of scores within a point here. Uh, let's start with you, Greg. Golda, PG rated. And uh, it runs for all of a hundred minutes. Six and a half to seven. Mm-hmm. And you, Peter? And we should also mention that uh, the film was Oscar nominated for its makeup and hair design. So uh, uh, Helen Mirren d- did go through a lot to uh, to to be part of that film. Uh, and I like the film. Uh, seven out of ten. Yeah, and and mine seven out of ten as well. So yeah, I as I expected, it was uh, sort of very very similar territory. Okay, so you are on J88FM, and if you want to contribute to the program, if you want to contribute to the station, 54 bucks a year gets you membership. Just consider it. Go online, j-air.com.au, and, yeah, that's what community radio is all about, support from the community. Let us look back at, um, I don't think we've spoken yet about Freud's last session, have we? So let's do that now. And that's a movie that is 109 minutes in duration, M-rated, and... Basically, it, it's a meeting that probably didn't take place, but could have, between the father of psychoanalysis and a fated author. And they discuss whether God exists. So that is the centrepiece of Freud's last session. Freud's played by Anthony Hopkins. He's in failing health. He's struggling. And with death approaching, he remains heavily opinionated. He's actually taken issue with a British author called C.S. Lewis. Matthew Good plays him, who's come out as a believer and he's written about his faith. Now, even though they don't know one another, Freud invites C.S. Lewis to his home for a bit of a chat. And when he arrives late, as Sigmund Freud points out more than once, he starts rationalising and, and Lewis responds. Their discussion, well, it's cerebral. Neither backs away from their previously stated position. Through that process, we find out about the backgrounds of both of them and they emerge through flashbacks and dreams because each of them has experienced deep emotional pain. Then you've got Freud's daughter, Anna, played by Liv Lisa Fries, who created the field of child psycho- psychoanalysis. And she's got an extreme attachment to her father. And he really has far too much control over her. She also has lurid fantasies and is in a lesbian relationship that her father does not countenance. For his part, C.S. Lewis, well, he's formed a special connection with a friend's mother having suffered trauma while he was on the front line fighting. Both of them, both major protagonists, fear death. And as the title suggests, Freud's last session, the conversation between the pair of them will turn out to be Freud's last substantive one. It's based on a play by Mark St. Germain. I think that's part of the problem because it looks like a play. And uh, sometimes you can get away with it in the movies. I don't think you could on this occasion. He wrote the screenplay with the director, Matt Brown, I did prefer the second half of the film to the first, and that's when what made Sigmund Freud and C.S. Lewis, who they are, really started boring out. Until that point, much of the first hour, well, I reckon it appeared, really all but appeared as space-filling waffle. Yeah, sure, that Freud and Lewis spoke with one another, but it was esoteric conversation, and it felt like the filmmakers were intent on blinding patrons with verbiage for the sake of it. I saw that as a fault of the writing, actually, which needed to be expressed in language that was more readily relatable. It wasn't a fault of the acting. Um, as a device, I think the flashbacks worked, but it was the material around it that had to be emancipated. Again, that's the word that I would use. The performances were sound. The production values in the film were also sound. Hopkins played Freud as verbally dexterous but flawed. Good was more restrained and respectful as C.S. Lewis. And Liv Lisa Fries was dutiful and harried as, as Anna. Look, as a window to the world, Freud's last session highlights the vulnerabilities and the failings in all of us as human beings, be that the learned or the unschooled. Learning to endure and managing grief, distress, sexual proclivities, well, it's a lifelong mission. 
all of which can only end one way, and that is when we, we meet our maker, whoever that might be. So Freud's last session, as I say, rated M, runs for 109 minutes. Greg, what do you think? Uh, look, I found this a little bit of heavy going there, a bit like that film we talked about a couple of weeks ago, Origin, where the discussion was about big ideas, big themes, but it didn't really engage the audience there. And I agree that this one is fairly um, constrained by its theatrical origins. There are a couple of attempts by the director, Matt Brown, to open it up a little bit. Um, you get the, that subplot following Freud's daughter, Anna, there, but, and also some flashbacks to Lewis's experiences in World War One that shapes him and his attitude there. But this film is heavily dialogue-driven, and most of it takes place in Freud's study there, so it, it doesn't really escape its theatrical, theatrical origins there, which is not very cinematic. Um, but the film explores some big ideas there, um, human frailty, the futility of war, um, death, grief, and, of course, the existence of God and religion and sex. Um, but I thought Hopkins was great here as Freud. He's full of bluster, he's verbally gifted, he's intelligent, and Hopkins is one of those actors who seems to get better with age. He seems to be enjoying a bit of a purple patch late in his career here. And Matthew Good also was good as Lewis there. He brings a sense of dignity and restraint to his performance there. And I thought the production design was good, recreating Freud's um, study there. Um, but, yeah, the esoteric conversations, as, as you said, Alex, don't really connect with the audience there. Um, yeah, so I think it's a um, small film that will um, reach a small specialist audience there. And ironically, Anthony Hopkins played C.S. Lewis in a 1993 film called Shadowlands. Ah, yes, he did too. Well done. Well picked up. Yeah, good stuff. Now, Peter, um, you're the recalcitrant one. Are you going to say this is a masterpiece or are you going to agree with Greg and I? I'm going to agree with both of you because I oh, yeah. came into this film expecting it to be uh, a really strong um, uh, discussion about life and death and, and so on uh, in this hypothetical uh, meeting mm. between C.S. Lewis and uh, Sigmund Freud. And I came away thinking that this, uh, that the screenplay was so superficial mm. and, and really didn't uh, get into really uh, uh, underneath their, their philosophies, their thinking and so on. It just remained a uh, very typical sort of banter, which uh, really disappointed me because I wanted a much stronger screenplay than uh, was presented. And yes, I know it's based on a stage play, uh, and yes, the whole thing is, of course, hypothetical, but nevertheless, I would have expected uh, a deeper insight into Freud's philosophy of psychotherapy and his uh, uh, attitude to religion or anti-religion uh, and C.S. Lewis's strong Christian principles. And uh, I just felt the film didn't go far enough or didn't do anything much to really explore those issues at all. So, uh, yeah, uh, well acted but very disappointing film. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's start with you then, Peter. You'll give it a five or something of that nature, will you? Correct, five out of ten. Yeah. Greg? I'm pretty much the same. Yeah, look, I mean, I, I thought it was okay, but not much more than that, so I'll give it a six. So, again, we're in sort of similar territory in terms of talking about that movie. Look, it's... it. Uh, I, I wonder... I, I hadn't seen the stage play... I, I presume you haven't either, Greg? No. No. So it'd be interesting to see what differences from the stage play, if any, uh, there were. Have you got any insight into that at all, Peter, uh, in terms of whether there were many changes to the script or you don't really know either? I'm not absolutely sure, but uh, from what I know is it was an adaptation which uh, tried to be more cinematic but uh, kept most of the dialogue that was on stage. Yeah, fair enough, and and that's what it it appears that way. And sometimes these things can work very, very well, but it's it's a ch it's a challenge, no question about that. On J eighty eight FM, let us talk about Jean de Barry, which is a sweeping period drama, and it covers the rise and fall, predominantly the former, of the primary lover of a former king of France, who was born Jean Becou, played by Maywen M A. I W E double N. That's the actor's name. And Jean Bacou was born on the 19th of August, 1743. She was the illegitimate daughter of a monk and a cook brought up by her mum. 
of lowly stock. She her road to the the king's bedchamber, quite an intriguing and circuitous one, marked by her intelligence, her artistry, and her industriousness. She's charming. She's witty. She longs to climb the social ladder. Soon enough, she she recognises her sensuality and sexuality, and she becomes a skilled courtesan. Her benefactor, the Comte de Barry, played by Melville Poupard, grows rich through her amorous encounters, and all the more so when she's introduced by the influential Duke of Richelieu, Pierre Richard, to a notorious womaniser being King Louis the Fifteenth, played by Johnny Depp in his first French language speaking role. So it's intoxication at first sight, and the king quickly d- declares her his favourite, while she unapologetically ignores propriety and etiquette, and, and she gets away with it. And to show his affection for her, the king gifts her a striking, expensive necklace and, wait for this, an exotic young black boy. Bear in mind, we are talking it's totally unacceptable, but we're talking about you know the 1700s. With the help of his valet, Laborde, played by Benjamin Laverty, King Louis moves Jean into his Versailles palace, sparking both derision and scandal. Now, standing in the way of their brazen love affair are three of the king's four daughters, who show her ill will and ridicule. The arrival of Marie Antoinette, played by Pauline Polman, who went on to become the last Queen of France before the French Revolution, marks yet another tipping point in this movie. The director and co-writer May Wan, her journey to bringing Jean de Barry's story to the screen began after seeing Sophia Coppola's Marie Antoinette in 2006. And she felt a very strong connection to the character played by Asia Argento, but she needed to feel confident she could actually do justice to the subject matter. And that took over a decade. And that during that time, she immersed herself into learning more about de Barry. She also undertook other projects. But the movie's been sumptuously filmed in 35mm on location at Versailles. Well, arguably, it's the palace to end all palaces. I mean, having seen it, I can attest to that. It is really quite something very, very special. Something that you should see once in your life at least. So it features majestic costuming and production design, really richly orchestrated, series of striking performances. Foremost amongst them, I thought May Wan was terrific, excelling as the woman that plays a dangerous game, displaying warmth and wanton abandon in that role. Benjamin Leverhe, master of diplomacy and restraint as the king's trusted personal attendant. I thought Depp, well, he fared well enough, mostly by virtue of the kowtowing that goes on around him in his role as ruler. He doesn't have to say too much, but uh, it's quite something that he's taken on a French language film. Good on him for doing so. The cinematographer, Laurent Dayland, has done a fine job capturing the opulence and the allure of the palace and the pomp and ceremony that goes on around it. It's... Look, as a film, Jean de Barry, it's spirited, it's alluring, satirical, historic drama with flourishes. And uh, no, I thought for what it did, it did it well. Uh, what did you think, uh, Peter? Uh, I didn't mind the film. I thought it looked sumptuous. It was well filmed. And May Wen is such a, an, an interesting filmmaker. Her film Police, for example, from a few years back is, is a superb film. And, uh, and I thought this one... She hasn't quite got it um, for some reason, even though it's quite enjoyable. The uh, the idea of this woman who uh, has this journey from poverty to being a courtesan and uh, and being part of Louis the Fifteenth's court, uh, etc. Um, I don't know. It felt I, I felt it should have been a much stronger film, more emotional and more um, uh, more depth to the characterization and to the relationship with Johnny. Uh, with Louis XV, played by Johnny Depp, who, by the way, speaks French at, almost like a native. So I was very impressed uh, by Johnny Depp's characterization. Look, I didn't mind the film. I thought it was okay. Uh, it's, uh, as I said, well-produced and well-acted, but I just felt it was lacking some sort of emotionality or or tension. And, in fact, the only tension in the film is when we know that uh, the French Revolution is about to occur at the end of the film. And I thought, boy, this could have been such a strong film. So uh, mildly disappointing for me. Oh, okay. I, I obviously thought a lot more than you did of it. I, Greg, you'll probably be closer to the middle of us uh, rather than me or, or Peter. Would that be true? Probably, yeah. I thought this was visually sumptuous. The costumes were fantastic. Lavish costume drama there, depicting the life of 
the eponymous heroine John DeBarry. Um, it was interesting in the way he delved into some of the politics of the court of Louis XV. That, that I thought that was interesting, but I wanted more. It didn't it lack any real drama here, yeah, I thought. It was just sort of kept going along there. Um, I wanted more of the drama, the tension of the court there. Um, I like the character of um, the board, played by Benjamin Laverne there, who is um, her sort of sympathetic character who helped advise Jean on her behaviour and how to ingratiate ingratiate herself into the court there. I thought at first the casting of Johnny Depp was a bit of stunt casting, but he sort of carried the role quite well there. He brought that sort of foppish presence, pompous presence to the role there. Um, I thought May Wan was quite strong in the role um, <coughs> she played here. Um, this is apparently one of the most expensive productions from France, but it's, mm. but it's twenty-two million dollars budget can all be seen on the screen with the production design, the costumes, and all that kind of stuff. It's quite spectacular there. Um, and apparently, some scenes were actually allowed to shoot in Versailles, which is most unusual. Yeah. And since yeah. cinematographer Lawrence Taylor. I thought captured the opulence and grandeur of the setting. Um, and apparently, but, but, reading up on this, Kubrick's 1975 film, Barry Lyndon, was apparently a huge influence on the look of this film, which you can understand. And there's a lush orchestral score from Stephen Warbeck. Um, this will appeal to fans of those kind of costume dramas, historical biopics. But I thought, like Peter, it probably could have been stronger in its depiction of the court and trees going on there. I certainly recognised elements of Versailles like I did Sydney in the movie that we just spoke about earlier today. But um, have you been there? Have either of you been to Versailles? Yeah. No. Briefly. Neither. Ah, okay. Well, yeah, it's certainly Briefly. a place. I have to there in um, January. Oh, wonderful. Excellent. And Peter, you, you've been to France though, have you not or not? No, I haven't. Ah, okay. Well, next time you're in Germany, you can... Uh, because I know you're a big, big advocate of the German Film Festival, you can deviate. It's not far away. <laughs> you can go and go and see Paris. Uh, anyway, having said all of that, uh, I, I think you'll give it the low score, Peter. So uh, let let's suggest that uh, you're you're going to be somewhere in the five to six territory. What do you reckon? Yeah, no, I thought it was okay, but mildly disappointing. Six out of ten. Yeah, there we go. Greg, you'll be somewhere in the middle there, so the six six plus. But uh, what, what what are you going to give it? Six out of ten. As I said, it lacked that dramatic intention. I thought it needed to be stronger with the politi- poli- politics and that kind of thing. Whereas I really did enjoy it for what it was, and uh, I, I'm giving it an eight out of ten. Jean de Barry is the name of the movie. M rated 117 minutes in duration. So we have got time to talk about Challenges, which is a movie that we also should pay a bit of attention to. It's M rated. It's 131 minutes. Now, it is hard hitting. It's 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 a sort of this hard hitting. No, yes, thank you very much. Um, you do the puns, don't you, Greg? So I normally do, but um, I just love all at the moment. Thank you kindly. Um, well, we need a tiebreaker then, don't we? Can we keep on going, Peter? Well, you know nothing about tennis. It's all right. Don't, don't worry Fault. about it. Thank you. Very. <laughs> Not okay. to log in whenever you like, Peter. Uh, <laughs> thank you. You got so many so many balls in the air here. Okay, so this is a hard hitting. <laughs> Let me start again. This is called Challenges. We're not talking about puns anymore. Uh, it, it's it's sort of, um, you've got this focused rising tennis prodigy catching the eye of a couple of best mates. Uh, she catches the eye of a couple of best mates uh, who are also on the circuit who compete for her affections. And, I mean, it's a dramatic comedic romance. It's directed by Luca Guadagnino, who did Call Me By Her Name. What a great movie that was. Patrick Swy is played by Josh O'Connor. Art Donaldson by Mark Mike Faced. So Josh O'Connor, Mike Faced, the two actors. And um, their characters, Patrick and Art, have been best friends, inseparable since the age of 12. Successful in junior doubles at the highest level, but Patrick is the better of the two players. And with a smirk all but permanently affixed to his face, he's also more of a player, in inverted commas, in a sexual sense of the word. It's Tashi Donaldson, played by Zendaya, who turns their collective heads in more ways than one. And I speak about how she approaches the game as a combat sport, as well as her undoubted sex appeal. So suddenly it's game on, shall we say, as uh, Patrick and Art first share their mutual infatuation 
before the situation off court becomes highly competitive as well. So again, Patrick wins out initially, but Art is playing the long game. And in time, the latter becomes a world force in tennis, while the former doesn't make the most of his opportunities and Patrick falls on hard times. An in- injury ends Tashi's promising career. She moves into coaching, becomes Art's coach and marries him. But Art's always struggled with the mental side of the game and he's going through a lean patch. And that's when Tashi advocates that he win back his confidence by competing in a low-paid challenger event. So that's where a lot of the up-and-comers play rather than on the main circuit. And who should Art come up against in the final of that tournament? None other than his old ally, who's now an adversary, Patrick. And the pair's long since fallen out. Tashi too wants nothing to do with Patrick, or does she? It spans 13 years until 2019, written by Justin Kuritzke. I'll try that again. Justin Kuritzke's, and he created his debut screenplay after establishing himself as a playwright. And he was inspired by watching a rather controversial match between Serena Williams and Naomi Osaka in the year 2019. As I say, it goes up till that point. It's also about the dynamics. Well, it's about the dynamics of power. It moves back and forth in time. In fact, far too frequently for my liking, it deals with attraction and motivation. Tashi Donaldson is the centre of attention. Just who does she find really appealing? Is it the well-meaning wimp or is it the bad boy and why? And look, while I do admire Luca Guadagnino's catalogue of filmmaking, which has also included the big, A Bigger Splash, Suspiria, Bones and All, just to name three, I thought the slow-moving, elongated scenes without dialogue in challenges really started to bother me. In fact, they became torturous. Even the up-tempo music score, which initially caught my attention favourably, became a millstone before the movie ended. And if the filmmaker's intent was to annoy his audience, it certainly worked on me. Uh, look, I greatly appreciated Zendaya's intensity, though. I thought her performance as the highly motivated Tashi was great. I thought that O'Connor's laid-back approach was was good too, but not so much his hallmark grin. That was overly used, uh, overused. It, it, you know, it, it, it didn't need to be used as often as it was. Nor was I sold by Mike Face casting as the good guy. I struggled to believe he was a major championship winner. And that's what he was painted as. So it needed, I reckon, this movie, a less is more approach. As it was, it felt stretched way beyond acceptances. That last scene alone just kept on going. It made me want to scream. So, yeah, relationships can be often are complicated, Long before the final credits on this credits on this deep dive into this threesome, I wanted out. So conceptually, it was a good idea. In terms of execution, while not without some merit, and I already mentioned that Zendaya was terrific, I was calling literally for a tiebreaker for after about ninety minutes. I mean, it, it kept on going, two hours eleven. So yeah, that's my take on challenges. P- Peter, what about you? I was very disappointed by this film, particularly because Luca Guadagnino is such a good director. It was quite clear that he had no confidence in the screenplay, so he did his best to paper over it by uh, concocting this menage a trois and this homoerotic uh, sort of uh, uh, subtext in the storyline um, by putting music into it, which really didn't belong in the film at all. And uh, in fact, overlaid some dialogue and. Uh, Correct. That was the thing that really got to me as well. But we're limited in time. So you didn't, you basically didn't like it as much as you wanted to. Uh, no, I didn't. And, and even the special effects with the tennis ball and the rackets and so on. I thought he just, he, he was not confident with the story, and so he tried his best to do this E2 Mama Tombian sort of remake. Um, so Challenges was a real disappointment to me. And Greg, in, in 60 seconds or less, your thought? Uh, I thought the tension between the three characters was quite palpable, and the extended tennis match itself became a metaphor for the relationship between the three. There's an enormous undercurrent of eroticism here, but I agree that the music score, the techno score, um overrode some of the dialogue there um, and became obtrusive and overbearing in some scenes there. Uh, and I thought that, that some of those idiosyncratic and stylish directorial flourishes that he and his cinematographer used um, to bring the tennis match alive sort of brought a bit of energy to the tennis match itself. as a visceral and highly cinematic approach there that put us into the um, match there. I thought the chemistry between the three leads was also palpable. And I use a raw carnality. So 
I thought um, Face had a boyish quality. Um, so what do you think overall, out of 10, Greg, what would you give it? I'll give it 6 out of 10. Only 6, Peter? Very disappointing, 4 out of 10. Wow. Failed it. Gee whiz, I, I'm giving it a 6.5 out of 10. Boys, we're out of time, and we're going to do it all again very, very soon. First on Film and Entertainment, Greg, thank you so much. Peter, thank you kindly, and uh, be good to one another. Catch you later on on First on Film and Entertainment.